Hello. My talk is titled Resilience of Slums. Over one billion people worldwide live in slums, and that number is slated to double by 2030. But what are slums? UN Habitat defines them as poorly built, overcrowded, underserviced neighborhoods that are under a constant threat of eviction. What is resilience? Resilience is the capacity of an individual or a community to survive, adapt, and grow in the midst of natural or man-made disaster. Usually around this time in my talk, people start questioning, how can slums be resilient? If anything, they're the opposite of resilient. They are vulnerable. Yes, they can be vulnerable, but I'm here to tell you a story of a slum that is resilient. This is the story of Pedda Jalarpeta slum in Vishakapatnam, India, a slum which is resilient temporally, spatially, and socially. Pedda Jalarpeta is the largest and oldest slum in the city of Vishakapatnam. Over 7,000 people live in less than 32 acres, a size which is one-sixth the size of this campus at a density which is double the density of downtown Cincinnati or over the Rhine. The slum is surrounded by tourist destinations such as parks and beaches. It is a stone's throw away from luxurious five-star hotels. It is smack dab in the middle of high-rise apartment buildings. But it continues to maintain its identity as a fishing village, as a low-income fishing village. And it temporal resilience refers to this ability of the community to maintain its identity for the past 30 years. So how did Pedajalar Peta remain a low-income community in the midst of this glamour and glitz? Was it pure luck? No. Like any other self-respecting slum, Pedajalar Peta survived a multitude of disasters. Its first disaster was in 1983 on a cold December night when 600 of the 800 huts in the slum burned to the ground. The community was devastated. Greater Vishakapatnam Municipal Corporation, which is the local governing body, redeveloped the slum. Slum redevelopments, however, are often controversial. There are literally books written about it and conferences held on the topic. Primarily, these redevelopments fail. Either they're poorly built, or when they are well built, they end up getting gentrified. High income and middle income residents move in, low income residents move out. The one reason for Padajalar Peta's success, slum redevelopment success, was Mr. Olisheti Chinnaya. Olisheti Chinnaya was a fisherman in Padajalar Peta. And he was the elected representative at the time of the redevelopment. So he used his influence to appoint the community's Gramasabha, which is the village assembly, the local leaders, as the neighborhood committee in charge of the redevelopment. That essentially allowed for a smooth redevelopment, a well-built community, and allotted the lots to the right people. That allowed the community to retain its identity as a low-income, affordable housing community for fishermen for the past 30 years. That linkage between the local leadership and a powerful politician was the secret for the successful redevelopment. After the redevelopment, the community faced other challenges. Cyclones, hurricanes, 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami, but its most formidable challenge was tourist-oriented development that started in early 2000. Starting in early 2000, Pedda Jalar Peta witnessed a multitude and avalanche of tourism-oriented developments in and around the community. These developments not only threatened to gentrify the community, but they also challenged the community's livelihood, fishing. The young fishermen in the community fought these developments. They used the media, and they used the legal measures, such as Coastal Regulation Zone Act, which prohibits de developments close to the beach, 
Marine Fisheries Regulations Act, which allow the communities to fight for their livelihood. Action Aid, an international aid organization, educated the youth of the community on how to use the media and how to use their, um, how to use their rights to fight for these developments. So once again, the community survived yet another threat due to this essential linkage between the youth leadership in the community and an international aid organization. This brings us to our second form of resilience, spatial resilience. <laughs> spatial resilience refers to the community's spatial resources, its beach and its streets. <coughs> Pedda Jalarapeta literally translates to large fisherman village. This has been a fishing village for generations. Um, the beach is not just an economic resource, it's also a cultural entity. 75% of the households in the community still depend on fishing. This is where the fishermen store their boats, repair their engine, and work on their nets. This is where they uh, relax after fishing, socialize, and talk to their um, cohorts. Just like the uh, beach, the streets of Pedajalarpeta are active and lively. Transportation is a secondary use of the streets. The primary use of the streets is to act as the living room of the community. This is where all the action happens. This is where the kids play. This is where the women socialize and shop. This is where the festivals are colorful and loud. This brings us to our third form of resilience, social resilience. 90% of the households in Pedajalarpeta live below the international poverty line of $1.25 a day. $1.25 per person per day. Even with that income, the residents donated 20,000 US dollars in 2006 to build this temple in their community. And the fishermen continue to donate 1% of their income for the temple upkeep. It is a huge economic burden on them, but they do it because the community is a big part of their life. These activities show the strong social networks within the community. The case of Pedda Jalarpeta illustrates that slums can be resilient, temporally, spatially, and socially. But resilience is a long and laborious process. The residents collaborated with government and non-government organizations to build their community from the ground up, to build their social and physical infrastructure. Urban poor are not vulnerable victims. They can be formidable warriors. They can fight for their human rights, for their community rights, and for their cultural rights. All they need is knowledge and support. All they need is those essential linkages that can provide them with those knowledge and support. Thank you.